Yes, good evening, and welcome to this month's meeting of the New York Society for General Semantics. Yeah, yeah! to you free of charge courtesy of the New York Society for General Semantics and we ask that you turn your phones off or, or throw them in the toilet uh, whichever um, will make them quieter <laughs> and uh, so we we bring this to you um, at, you know whenever we can uh, and uh, we don't ask you for any fees or any uh, membership dues uh, although uh, we are we do have uh, on our website a, a page where you can donate if you feel so moved uh, we're always happy about that um, but we do um, suggest that you join the Institute of General Semantics um, which uh, uh, are are yes. Your kid half oh, price. Half price. We can't yeah. do that. Wow. We, we can. What? I could get what? a, a multi-pencil oh. pen. Oh my goodness. See me. See me at the end. See me at the end. A half. You can join the. You can join the institute. Twenty-five dollars. Twenty-five dollars. Five dollars. That is a bargain. That is robbery. It is. You're robbing me. Give me a twenty-five. Larry is president of the Institute of General Semantics, so he has authority to cut the membership fee in half. I don't know. We'll, we'll see about we'll see about this at the next board. <laughs> well, so there's no better time to become a member of the Institute of General Semantics, and with that membership fee, you get a subscription to the journal, etc. Um, edited by Tom Gencarelli. A marvelous journal that has been in publication since 1943, and whose former editors include S. I. Hayakawa, Bill Postman, and Emma Dew. Okay. Um, and uh, also with your IGS membership, you get free admission to the annual Alfred Krasipski Memorial Lecture Dinner, um, which is generally held, will be held at the Princeton Club. We have the dates, I think? 9th to 11th. Uh, well, be October 9th, uh, the Friday evening. Uh, we're still in the selection process for, for the lecturer. Um, and that's always followed by a two-day symposium on Saturday and, and Sunday, um, which you're welcome to attend and also to participate in if you think you have something to say, uh, which many people do. Um, but in any event, uh, we do encourage that membership, and it's a wonderful opportunity tonight as we really take up a topic that is relates to the founder of General Semantics, Alfred Korzybski. So tonight's session is what would Korzybski say? And for those of you who are not familiar with him, Alfred Korzybski was born on July 3rd, 1879 in Warsaw, Poland, and he died on March 1st, 1950, while at work at what was then the headquarters of the Institute of General Semantics. He introduced his general theory of time binding in his first book, Manhood of Humanity, originally published in 1921, and then introduced the discipline of general semantics in his magnum opus, Science and Sanity, published in 1933. And he was famously motivated by his experiences at, uh, serving as a soldier during the First World War and coming out of that the need to promote peace and prevent military conflict. He was further moved to develop and promote general semantics 
by the horror of the Second World War and then the threat of the atomic bomb in its aftermath. Uh, and I would note that following the First World War, uh, there was great concern over mass communication, pop propaganda, and the manipulation of public opinion, and that included interest in the use and misuse of symbols and language to influence thought and action. And there were a number of efforts to educate the public and provide ways of resisting the assault on attitudes and behavior, and that includes Korzybski's general semantics. Um, when we look at the events that occurred during this time, it's actually quite amazing. Uh, during World War I, there was the Russian Revolution of 1917, which sent a shock to the international system, especially as in 1922, it resulted in the establishment of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the first communist state, and the beginning of communism as an international movement representing a direct challenge to Western democracy and capitalism, of course, and expanded, then expanded into Eastern Europe and the Far East at the end of the Second World War. We had the stock market crash of 1929, the financial crisis that really called into question the economic basis of liberal democracy. And recovery was said to begin in 1933, the same year that Science and Sanity was published, but the Depression really lasted well into the 40s. The rise of fascism in Europe represented yet another challenge to the Enlightenment and rationalism and political systems based on Republican government and rule of law. We had fascist movements in, of course, Italy, then Nazi Germany, uh, but also in Hungary, Romania, Yugoslavia, Greece, Lithuania, Korzybski's native land, Poland, and with the Spanish Civil War, Spain, which persisted well into the post-war period. Nazism in particular brought into the fore theories of racial, uh, racial theories and stereotyping, scapegoating uh, that resulted in the Holocaust and discrimination and persecution existed throughout the West, throughout American history, uh, including the legacy of slavery in the form of Jim Crow, separate but equal, the, the establishment of Japanese internment camps on the West Coast, and more subtle forms of exclusion and fear-mongering, uh, including the McCarthyism, um, blacklisting in Hollywood, academia, and government. I mean, all this and more serves as a reminder that the development of general semantics took place during tumultuous times and was a response to a time of great conflict and tragedy. When we look back on the founder of general semantics as an exceptional individual, not perfect by any means, but a thoughtful, caring, and inspired human being. And as we presently find ourselves in troubled times and multiple fronts, it's worth trying to put ourselves in the shoes of significant thinkers such as Alfred Korzybski and speculate and extrapolate on what he might say about current events where he's still alive today. To that end, we formed a panel of general semanticists to answer the question, what would Korzybski say? And so we have with us tonight Michael Plu on my left, member of the Board of Directors of the New York Society for General Semantics and a, a professor of communication at Manhattan College. To his left, Terry Manzella, member of the Board of Directors of the New York Society for General Semantics. You've already uh, been introduced informally to Marty Levinson, who is president of the Institute of General Semantics, treasurer of the New York Society for General Semantics, and to Tom Gencarelli, who is the editor of Etc., and a member of the board of directors of the New York Society for General Semantics, and professor of communication at Manhattan College, and last but most certainly least, the lovely <laughs> Jackie <Whoa>. Roddick, <laughs> the treasurer. <laughs> Treasurer of the Institute of General Semantics, 
secretary uh, on the board of directors of the New York Society for General Semantics. Um, and so, we welcome, we welcome our panelists, and we'll begin with, uh, I'll th throw out a, uh, a topic and ask them what would Korzybski say, and uh, Waiting for George to thank you, George. Yes. Okay, and and uh, we'll ask them what would uh, Korzybski say, and uh, and then uh, after we do this for a while, we'll we'll open it up to your own uh, for you to pose your own kind of questions. Um, so I'm going to. Uh, start out with a big one, um, and you know, since Korzybski, you know, I, Korzybski was an engineer. Um, he believed in the importance of science, and that the idea that science, the scientific method, provides us with the best me means of uh, getting a, evaluating our reality and understanding what is going on. Um, one of the big issues and the concerns today, perhaps the biggest of all, is climate change and what scientists are saying. And so, what would Korzybski say about climate change? Do you want me to go down the row, or do you want to... I'll start. Uh, I really have no idea what he would say. <laughs> Right, <laughs> my thought on that. After he said, oi, then. <laughs> <laughs> or OMG. <laughs> um, but we can talk about what kind of ideas we can uh, get from looking at a system of, uh, which is based on the scientific theory, but also on the idea of time binding, which is building on the, um, the person, the generations before us, building on the knowledge and the technology and all the advancements they've made. And I think that's what's brought about, this, this is my opinion, the climate change is in the second half of the 20th century has um, done all the advancements te technologically and scientifically and so forth have brought about the, the, the problems we have with the climate and the, the greenhouse effect and everything else. So this time binding building on the achievements of the generation before, it's not always the good thing. I think so often we think of time binding, oh yes, we're learning, learning and going forward. But as Milton Dawes used to say, a teacher years ago, he would say, is, is it time binding to build a better bomb? And the answer is yes, it really is. But now that we've time binded our way to this climate change um, crisis, um, what can we do about that now? And um, th that's that's what I think. Time binding, it's, it's not always a good thing, and how are we going to correct that? And probably with the, the scientific method, again, with premises and conclusions that we can uh, remedy ways to move forward. But there's lots more to say, and I'm sure. Well, okay. Well, I think, uh, you know, Korzybski felt that Science, he wrote the book Science and Sanity, mm -hmm. which means basically he felt science was a good way for people to become sane. Mm -hmm. He felt scientists were sane when they were using the scientific method. They weren't necessarily sane in their personal lives, they knew what they were doing. <laughs> but when they were using the scientific method, it was a way to promote sanity, and science has made improvements. That's why people aren't living in caves, they're living in modern houses and high rises, while beavers still build the same damn beaver dam. <laughs> Uh, but basically, I think Korzybski would say, let's see what the scientists, when they're doing science, have to say about climate change. And from what I've been reading, well over 90% of the scientists say there's a problem with climate change. And I think Korzybski would say, well, if scientists say there's a problem with climate change and they're doing the science, there's probably a problem, you know, problems with climate change and we should look to see how we can address it. Um, I think the first thing that he would say is, you know, I wrote these two books, and the second one, what, what, you think it was a doorstop? It was so big you didn't read it, right? Why didn't you read my book? It would have helped. And when, with respect to climate change, and, you know, I, I'd like to think he was 
a bit of an iconoclastic kind of reader and synthesizer of, of ideas, because there were so many ideas gesticulating at that time that really are related to the work that he was doing. But at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, when we had started really getting a, a grip on world population, there were approximately a billion people on the planet. And at the turn of the 20th into the 21st century, there were just over 3 billion. And now in 2020, we're on our way to 8 billion. So whether we talk about this in terms of climate change or not, there's an extensional reality that is that the planet can only support this many people using its resources for so long a time. And you know, I think that he maybe would have read Paul Ehrlich, who said, you know, and, and we, a scientist up uh, uh, at, at Harvard, who, you know, said we can reduce all of the world's current problems down to the problem of overpopulation and what that does to this small blue, you know, uh, orb floating in space. Well, I think he would be interested in facts, and he would be talking about the fallacy of alternative facts, that there is some verifiable truth in science that does not lend itself to alternative facts. And um, we have now, what, uh, what, what I would say is we have an either or polarization going on in our society based on what we hear coming from media and what we hear coming from politicians. And uh, where are the facts? I think he would want the scientific community to step up much more forcefully than they are now. I mean, they're out there, but I think one of the problems is that uh, we're in silos. Um, and the scientific community, maybe other people think of them as egghead society. And, and, and you know, there is this sort of labeling and name calling which was something that, if you do it in the extreme, you would say that you, the name of the book is Science and Sanity. It's on a continuum from sane to insane. And that the polarization is moving toward an insane society, is how I'm looking at it. And I think that he would agree that we have a very large problem in terms of communicating with the different factions so that maybe we can find the areas of agreement which is what we really need. We really need to stop polarizing into these different factions and figure out what's good about A, what's good about B, and that, and then build on that, and that would be a positive time build. Finding. I really, I struggled with the, the overarching question, what would, what would Korzybski say? And, and, you know, I, I thought, it's impossible to know exactly what he would say, and, and particularly because you take a person out of you know the life experiences that he had from 1879 right into in, into his death at, at 1950 and and had he lived through all of the events that unfolded after his death from 1950 to the present which is roughly the same amount of time he lived right right the 71 years and then there's sort of 70 years since his death yeah. um I mean, you know it's it's a whole lifetime of additional experience and a whole lifetime of really incredible acceleration and and change and evolution of, of you know the world that that he died um, while, while living in the world he, he died um, and so how would that have changed him and and what would he have added or subtracted it's, it's hard to say but I, I think sort you know what's left behind Korzybski is the people who have carried the mantle of Korzybski and as extensions of Korzybski a lot of us have said things in the interim, um, and so I think what would Korzybski say? In some sense, is, an ex is by extension the things that we continue to say, and and um, so with that in mind, and with this particular question in mind, I thought it, I always think sort of Lewis Mumford's an interesting case, where Lewis Mumford had a particular faith, for example, in in you know the possibilities of electricity and the, and, and the way that the world might become more organic as a result of electrical systems taking over and so forth. And, uh, and then that came crashing down on him when his son died in, in World War II, when uh, Gettys died, his son Gettys died in World War II, and, and he became quite cynical about all of it and said, we haven't learned a damn thing, and 
we've doomed ourselves to this path by not learning any lessons from it. And, and it strikes me that there could be that level of cynicism for a person who believed so strongly in science, who, whose mathematical and engineering sensibilities uh, had been pushed so far to the extreme that a form of madness comes out of both mathematics and engineering um, between big data and the algorithms that constitute our, our present day environment, um, that, that the faith that he had in those faculties and, 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 those, and those disciplines that he invested his life in had become so corrupted that they actually brought about our downfall, I think is something to consider. Um, and I, and I, I don't know how to answer the, the climate change question except to say that you know, part of the insanity is that the climate change is brought about by mathematics and engineering and their misapplication and that something akin to the good old gut human feeling, something from our traditions of faith and so forth might be the balance required of mathematics and engineering so that we have reason, but reason that's balanced out by something that mm -hmm. is, is hard to sort of pin down. Um, and, um, you know, that applies to a number of things that are probably on your list, but climate change in particular, people don't, I mean, there are people who question the science, but mainly people don't question the science, I think, but feel paralyzed to do anything about it because it seems so large. It's not the rational part of it, it's the what do I do about it as a single solitary human being and, and, and finding collective action uh, and, and prioritizing different values that, that's really the root of our, our, our paralysis here. Um, that's not necessarily, I mean, that partly comes from better modes of rational thought, but it also comes from simply recognizing the shared fate that we have and, and you know, suspending some of our efficiency-oriented goals in favor of survival. Um, I, there's a sort of a fine balance there between mathematics and reason and, 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 and sort of the insanity that might sprout from them. I don't know, I don't know what he'd say, but I suspect that's... I, I might call it the non-rational yeah. versus insanity. Oh, yeah. But a thing not often spoken about is that if you read um, Krasitsky, a very lengthy biography by Bruce Kodish, he, Krasitsky was a very passionate man and a lover of, of people. That That's why he yeah. started the whole theories in the beginning because he just couldn't believe this horrors would happen in this war and he really cared about people deeply and if you get beneath the surface of his studies you can see that and I think he'd be very upset today um, that what we're doing and I just read this today it's the, the preface of um, Rachel Carson's The Silent Spring and it's I am pessimistic about the human race because it is too ingenious for its own good. Mm -hmm. Our approach to nature is to beat it into submission. Mm -hmm. We would stand a better chance of survival if we accommodated ourselves to this planet and viewed it appreciatively instead of skeptically and dic dictator like a dictator. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, but I think we right. would say exactly that. Yeah. And um, we need to put, pull the human into it. Say, what are we doing to our planet, to ourselves, to our children and our grandchildren, mm -hmm. that passion. Yeah, and I, I do want to point out, and, it, and it, I, it was very important that you brought up the Korzybski's biography. Um, you know that this is actually a Bruce <coughs> Kodish wrote uh, a massive uh, tome, uh, perhaps a little too <laughs> too much, but uh, you know what? I, I mean, certainly one one significant moment was in the aftermath of the Second World War, the atomic bomb, and uh, and I think he was very taken by the fact that he was among the many, many um, people in the sciences who were contacted, by, I think by mail or telegram, by Albert Einstein, um, you know, with the message that we have to do something about this, that we can't just let what happened, what did happen, happen you know, which is just the the um, proliferation of nuclear weapons by our government and then by the Soviet Union and then by other governments. So Korzybski was grappling with, you know, it did respond to the idea of an existential threat to human life. Uh, you know, I, I think it's that's something that sort of receded you know, in today's world, but um, you know, I, I know for me and, and 
and for those of us older than Mike here, um, <laughs> yeah, it kind of grew up with nuclear <laughs> nightmares and, and that sense that, you know, it could happen at any moment and, and especially in, uh, uh, us New Yorkers uh, living at ground zero, you know, I mean, it was always New York that got moved, you know. It was, right, it was never Wisconsin. We had bombshells. Yeah, but you know, we we were always the ones that you know, safe. Yeah. yeah, we were always the ones that that the bomb the bombs were landing on in the movies. So and we used to get under our desks and grapes. Yeah, and yeah. But that was fun. That was fun. That was fun. It, it, it was. Came, it was. You. In case we were bombed, we were going to be protected but, by, by the death. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't pull the citation out of my hat. He did publish a piece, etc., in response to the dropping of the bomb. Um, shortly after. Um, I'm trying to remember what he said. I, I, if I had my laptop, I'd pull it up. But, uh, we weren't allowed to bring any papers with us. <laughs> I had mine. <laughs> <laughs> As you see, we were not Well, do you remember what the gist of it? You know, what was he? Well, if he, let's put it this way, if he was actually asked for a response, then he probably had just published his response to, you know, again, after his experience in World War I and after seeing the rest of the war happen, this was just the cataclysmic, no, not the official end, but the cataclysmic mm -hmm. end of the war, right? And speaking to it as an abomination. And yeah, it was interesting to listen to Mike talk and then and listen to Jackie because his whole project was a humanistic project. You know, it's, it's about human use and creation of, of symbols, but from a scientific bent, from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. you know, he's a humanist. Well, since we brought up, I mean, we're getting into war. I mean, the fact is that we've been at war now for for the longest time, although we don't feel it the way that you know it was felt in, in previous eras. Uh, and you know they uh, refer to it sometimes as forever wars. You know, um, so uh, how do you think uh, he would? You know, what would he say about uh, the current state of uh, warfare uh, in the world today? Which you know, all, I mean, it includes. The, fact, the increasing use of drones and and other uh, kind of non-manned uh, you know form, forms of, of uh, destruction and uh, you know and how would he uh, I'm having set out to prevent war <laughs> from happening uh, what would he say about the state of, of affairs today and yeah like I, I I think you know as people who are not people who are not directly affected by the impact of war in the way others around the world are, where, you know, 9-11 was an incredible shock to the American system because it was the first time since Pearl Harbor that a major attack took place on U.S. soil. But, and I don't want to diminish it because, you know, it had an incredible shocking effect and, and thousands of people died. But to compare that event to the amount of violence and death and displacement and so forth that have happened in its wake around the world, it's a blip on the radar and to suggest that we understand war in any way would be a, a gross overstatement because war to us is a shadow, it's an abstraction. It's, you know, we're not conscious of that abstraction. We can talk about war in the most theoretical ways possible, but we don't walk through rubble and we don't see every single neighbor in our midst with multiple family members having been killed in conflict and so forth. And it's not to say that we can't empathize with people around the world, but we're not inclined to empathize with them in, the, in a more direct way. Is that war is an abstraction. The drone aspect of it that you brought up is the most abstract way that we, I mean, you know, McLuhan always talked about the, the, you know, the bomber pilot dropping bombs from a cockpit thousands of feet above the air and not having a sense of the consequences of this technological action. But we're all the pilots in, in these cockpits as, as we you know send people over to kill and die and, and, and fight in our name and don't have any sense of the real human cost of these things. So I think, you know, in terms of Korzybski's ideas, these abstractions to us are talking points and they're sort of mediated 
curiosities for us and we go about our business without ever thinking that this is a perpetual state of life for people all around the world and much of it at our own, at our hands. And that we, in a democratic society, we owe it to people for these things not to be abstractions, to be conscious of the fact that we've abstracted human life so far away from ourselves that we're able to toss it away um, without much effort. 900,000 people are on the move in Syria, mostly children yeah. and, and women, with no homes, nowhere to go. And uh, I, I remember yesterday, a little infant died from freezing to death in that cold environment. And I was thinking about the Vietnam War was the first televised war, and people mobilized, and, and probably because it was our voice and some gals were over there fighting the war. But now this is another televised war, and we have this same level, a dip, level of abstraction from it that you're talking about that makes it sort of not real. Uh, you know, I was struck when the drone killed this Khomeini, what was this guy, Soleimani, Soleimani, when the president described it as what, as a, a movie. He said it was like a movie. And, then, and I, I thought, well, we've become, and he's the chief, become a, <laughs> the chief person of this, we've become televised, so to speak, or meteorized, or so involved with the visual and how we see things that it becomes commonplace to make a split between reality and, and television and not then make the next split that this is reality and not not a film. Oh, it was like watching a film. And if I could just interject, because as much as I'm frequently critical of Trump, Barack Obama was the drone president. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, and so in, in fairness, Correct. In, in, in fairness, it doesn't matter which political brand you're associated with. As right. Americans in this technological society, right. we're equally sort of complicit in all of this. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, I yes. think uh, I think we'll just, it would be okay with drones, depending on the war. I mean, the World War II, if there were drones, I think there was some kind of drone. I don't think you'd have any problems killing Nazis in World War II with drones. The problem with the war on terror is Bush's war. And basically, President Bush, who was for religious reasons and maybe other reasons, started this war on terror. And so uh, I think Korzybski would have pointed that out, that this isn't something that, you know, he sold a phony bill of goods on the WMDs, pretty much knew it wasn't there. And so we went to, this is a sort of a phony war. And it's really at his, you know, we think Trump is a, is a bad president. I mean, my argument would be Bush is a hell of a lot worse. I mean, he's more polite. Uh, but in any event, <laughs> the war on terrorism is his war. And I think, you know, abstract is important, but I think you have to also get it down to concrete specific. And Korzybski would look, how do we get into this war on terror? Well, we sold the country on the war on terror. People voted for it, and now we're here. And our Gorbin president might have been a whole different thing. So I think uh, it's not so much the drone, because I think drones are okay to kill your enemy. If you're fighting a war, I think you want know, to kill your enemy. But uh, we're in a war that maybe we shouldn't have been in. It's maybe a long war. Um, Doug Rushkoff, in one of his recent frontline documentaries, um, I'm trying to remember the title, but he looked at... Tom, can you speak up a little bit? Sure. He looked at drone operators. Yeah. And really what he was looking at specifically was the fact that if you're in warfare, on the front, in the battlefield, dropping bombs over a city. It's one thing to, to do that and to go back to base, but you're still with military people in this situation, in this context. Versus guys who were guiding drones and dropping bombs from a base, I believe it was in Arizona, and who at the end of the day went home to their wives yeah. and their kids, mm. and that the juxtaposition of living a normal life and then going into effectively you know have this televised video game like uh, job to drop bombs on people the, that that caused them more psychological problems than than traditional soldiers uh, and, and you know bomb droppers at war mm -hmm. um, by the way I there is a um, an excerpt from it, it's called the release of atomic energy um, written in August of 1945. I only have the first page. Um, 
but this is this is what Krasinski actually said. Uh, for many years, scientists suspected the enormous energies inside of the atom. They also suspected that if those energies were released, that they might have tremendous destructive power, which lately has been proved empirically. Bit of understatement. Um, and then to follow up a little later, one of the consequences of the latest discovery is that the old methods of warfare become obsolete. In the future, a few airplanes and a few hundred atomic bombs would eliminate a New York, a Chicago, a Paris, a London, a New Berlin, a New Tokyo. Scientific discoveries do not remain secrets. On the other hand, <laughs> the Nuclear Energy Commissions and so on, if you read anything, that they write, and you, you can find out that there are healthy ways to use atomic energy in yeah, small cool. doses, and it would be an antidote to some of the problems that we have with fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So I think the polarization of uh, is still ringing. Uh, there is such a vitriolic, negative feeling about atomic energy that we've lost the ability to figure out how to harness it for positive. Mm -hmm. And you know the idea of the uh, nuclear plants exploding and so on and so forth. But now I've read about you know little pellets that could keep you know an entire university in life for, for six months and it's only this big. Mm -hmm. And so we have we have to get to I guess the the middle ground, you know and that's right at because Korsipsky warns us about the the opposites, the getting rid of the two valley orientation, getting rid of the, the, the excluded mm -hmm. middle, not illness, <laughs> right. blah blah blah. You know, and this is right there. Et cetera. Blah, blah, blah. Et cetera. Et cetera. Et cetera. I get tired of saying et cetera, I now call it blah blah blah. Blah blah. That's the yeah. that's the special edition of the journal. Right. Blah. Jack, you, you, you. Um I you know Postman said um the uh, two value orientation, the either or, all or nothing, has long been considered one of the most seductive roads to racism, prejudice, and war. Mm, right. And it, it, it's just this way and this way, and not, nothing, nothing between different. the excluded middle. Yeah. Well, um, since you bring it up, uh, we continue to grapple with racism. Um, you know, we, we forget how much a part of the 20th century it was, not just, you know, in terms of black and, and white, but in, uh, in regard to Asians, uh, Nazi theory of, of race, races included, uh, Jews included the Slavic peoples, and they had theories about all different eth ethnicities. Um, and today we find ourselves, you know, very much still grappling with the problem of, of race here in the United States. What would Korzybski say to us now? Um, Jackie, do you want to? Well, if I recall, um, Korzybski was a bit of a racist himself. <laughs> so um, he would probably time bite it into a better way of thinking by now. But um, I would think that he would want to evaluate every person as an individual and, and not uh, package them into races. Like this is one thing, another. And, and uh, I, I, I don't think he would have wanted to. It's hard to say because of what I know about him. But um, a thinking person wouldn't want to categorize one people all this way and another people all this way. And um, this, I have a definition for general semantics for all of us, because there's no one definition. General semantics is a process-oriented, problem-solving system to help people better connect their words, thoughts, and actions, and feelings to objective reality in a way to up toward problem-solving. And um, I think racism is a problem then it's, it is now. In some ways, it's getting worse, uh, ebbing and flowing. And uh, I, I don't think he'd, he'd approve at all. Well, he'll be changing his mind. If you read the Korzybski uh, bio, uh, this big book by Bruce Kodish, there's a chapter on anti-Semitism. 
and the publicity in the 1920s, to read what he writes, is uh, quite a bit of an anti-Semite. And it was really hard against Jews. The Hebrew Bible is terrible. The Jews are communists, capitalists. So, so this chapter is on anti-Semitism. And then at the end of the chapter, he becomes a Zionist. <laughs> and he's promoting these Jews, with wonderful things, etc. So Bruce, who wrote the book, uh, basically said, you know, he had to change his mind. So the good part there is, Korzynski would say, well, you know, people can change their minds over time. You can be a racist, you know, dating. Korzynski in 1920 is not Korzynski right. in 1940. So people can change their minds. So with racism, people can change their minds too. Although I think, uh, I believe what Lyndon Johnson said uh, when he ran for president about racism, he said, you know, uh, if the poorest white guy in the South, if the laborer, can think he's better than the most intelligent, successful black guy, that's what they're going to do. So you have a lot of people that are racist just because they feel the need for status. Uh, and I think that's probably true. I think Korzynski would have seen that too. He wouldn't agree with Johnson. Well, I, I think that implicit in his work is this idea that what people think is a real thing is real in its consequence. So what I mean by that is they become the values of a person, how they define life or how life is defined for, for them becomes a reality for those particular people. So you have to be taught to hate. You have to be taught to say that this is this group is no good and my group is better. So that the consequences of what we might call uh, something that isn't real becomes real to the person. And uh, the idea of the uh, extremes. Well, if you're if you say this is how it is, you don't leave any wiggle room for maybe I'm wrong. No humility. And I think that he's against the idea of this way or that way, that there was a continuum always in all things. And so even if he was in 1925 anti-Semitic, he could have evolved past that because what was real to him at time one was not real to him at time two, time three, time four. And that reality uh, is we're, what we're trying to do, I would imagine, I would say, is to learn how to self-reflect. Uh, I consider, I'll, I'll read my definition, that he developed a system for critical evaluation of messages and information, and I call it learning to think about how we think, and placing a pause button between the information and our responses, that we, we need to develop that critical way of thinking. And so how real is real, you know, to people changes, and we grow, and, that, and that's what you're pointing out, that you know, he, at one point, didn't see the light of how he was viewing things. And I would say the propaganda that was coming out um, influenced certainly a whole, a whole war, you know, World War II. The propaganda, we, I think we need to talk about propaganda. And we have it going on, exactly what went on then, is going on now in terms of labeling people as the other. Mm -hmm. So I, I think to that point, um, and, and to some of the previous comments, uh, I, I, I'd like to say that we don't know, again, whether he would have persisted in some of these prejudices because we know some of the people who are the most intellectually gifted and, and, and sort of uh, thoughtful people in all of their fields sometimes persisted in horrible beliefs. But I do think that there's at least some evidence based in, in, in the system of general semantics and based in some of the documentation of his thinking that he would have made progress in this area. And I was, Tom knows, I've been reading a little bit of the Olivet uh, lectures, um, that, that, that piece um, from what, 1933 is that? Later. Uh, is it later? 38. 38, maybe. And, uh, this is Korzybski's <laughs> lecture. Korzybski's lecture is at Olivet, is it college? Olivet College, right? Uh, and there's, what, 12 or 13 of the, le of the lectures. And, and there's some quirky stuff in there. I mean, if anybody reads, he has a very unusual way of presenting, and I've been kind of amused by it with, with Tom a bit. But it struck me that in one of the very earliest lectures, maybe the first one, um, he talks explicitly about the white race, and, th and there's an asterisk next to that, which requires the reader to flip a number of pages ahead. And I eagerly 
flip forward to say, what, is, what the hell is this going to say about the white race? And I don't know, and this, I sort of lean on other people here who may know better than I do about the publication histories, that the footnote suggests that Korzybski often referred to the white race and explicitly said that he, he talks about the white race because he's not educated enough in the language and the habits of people of other races to, to, to speak intelligently on the subject, which I think does bode somewhat well for, for, for his, um, his future thinking. But I also think if you, if you, you know, if you look at the progression of the way we've talked about race in, in, in scholarly circles and, and, and subsequently in culture, that you see things like uh, Stuart Hall's discussion of race as a floating signifier, or you see people talking about things like essentializing discourses and, and calling attention to these, these problems of language, these problems of symbolic work and the way that they construct and reproduce harmful ideological systems, I can't help but think that that falls very much in line with, with general semantics. Um, and, and I don't know to the extent that any of those people who talked about race as a floating signifier or essentially essentializing discourses and so forth had any familiarity with Korzybski, but that, that, that those kinds of things blend quite nicely together with the ideas of non-identity and so forth, and that had he survived in, in indefinitely into our present day, having read all of those things, that he would have had more productive commentary on them, uh, but fortunately sort of as either intentionally or, or unintentionally, we have extensions of this way of thinking that have led us to where we are and hopefully continue to help us improve you know, as, we, as we stumble forward into the future. When, when we say, you know, what would Korsivsky say to, you know, when you brought up index and Korsivsky of humanity and science and sanity is not the, the ghost of Korsivsky in the room or, you know, or that you know he's up there looking down at us, you know, deciding whether we're you know, or up. giving our or or, 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 or up, <laughs> deciding whether we're, we're being fair to his legacy. Um, you know, time binding suggests that we we stay with the received wisdom of our times and you know what comes down to us since he was alive. And, and I think that, you know, maybe you would have read Cornel West, who, you know, at, at some point says, and I'm paraphrasing, isn't it uh, amazing how much of an issue is made of the simple matter of skin pigmentation? And the idea that, you know, the human race is one race and everything else is culture, <laughs> right? Everything else is, is how we, and, and it, of course, it's easy for me to talk about this as a white guy. Um, but uh, I, I would hope that he would realize that we shouldn't even be using the word in that sense. I would hope. Yeah, which is uh, certainly an interesting point. And you know, maybe we can connect some of this to concepts in general semantics, because we shouldn't assume that everyone knows the you know something like non-identity. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, uh, you know, one thing that, that occurs to me, and, and I would just say that one of the great contributions that general semantics did make uh, was towards education regarding stereotypes, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, really forms the basis in a way that became kind of invisible because it was just absorbed into general education about how to avoid stereotyping and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. But when you talk about his own change, um, I wonder if you could relate that to the distinction between intentional and extensional orientations that, that he talked about. The intentional is, is with an S rather than a T, I-N-T-E-N-S, um, but isn't that the kind of change that, uh, that, that he latched on to in, in sort of uh, uh, raising his awareness? Does he remain exceptional, constantly searching for um, more information on whatever it was he was thinking of, and always asking questions, and never saying, this is for sure. Oh, it's always flexible, but, and um, he would have remained that way. But how do you reconcile that with some of the things that we know about him as a person? That I'm not asking you. I'm yeah, no, throwing no, the question out. No, he, he had his faults as a person. I mean, if you told him to read about his relationship with his wife, um, it was horrible. I mean, basically, he was a dictatorial, 
real chauvinist. Uh, you know, she tried to learn this stuff. He said, oh, don't, don't talk to me about that. You know nothing. It's stupid. You're killing my work. Don't study it. <laughs> I mean, basically, it was her life. And she finally got a farm and she left. <laughs> she finally shot. She got extensional. She got eggs. Right. So, I mean, you know, the theory is good, but I mean, I mean, the theory, I think, is very good. But, I mean, obviously, he had flaws that he didn't see in himself, I suppose. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, no, that's, that's the point. Well, yeah. Right, so what would Korzybski say? I mean, you know, you can say what he would say to, about the theory, and what would he say that he couldn't see about his own theory because he had issues we all do. Yeah. So it's a complex thing, what would Korzybski say? That's yeah. what I'm saying. Well, I, I'm not asking what would he do. Yeah, <laughs> right, what would he say? But, you know, I, I mean, you know, we don't have to get so deeply into no, but, the idiosyncrasies of his biography, right. but you know, rather, you know, taking his ideas and, right. and applying them. Right. But, but yeah. you know, could use the terms subjective and objective as, as pretty much you know, the, the same meanings. Our job is to try to find objective knowledge and objective truth and to you know, not be caught up in what is, as he said, intentional, not be caught up in in trying to turn what we think into what is or, or what we, everyone else should think. Mm -hmm. right. Well, that's the map territory thing yeah. to do, just holding on to an old map without ever examining the territory. Mm -hmm. I or think of a map as the right map. Yeah. Right. right. Believe it. Believe your map is the right map or... Um, yeah. When you're trying to map a territory that is trying to be more objective, um, don't make the territory too big. Sometimes it's bit by bit, you know, the calculus approach um, a little bit. But I think of a, a famous, I think, quote of Krasinski is, um, I said what I said, I didn't say what I didn't say. <laughs> so, I mean, I think he shut down a lot of people with that line. We're trying to put more into what he was trying to say with the extensional thinking. So extensional thinking is constantly testing and being open right. to changing your thinking and not going by what you think you know, but rather by being open. And that involves more of the use of senses. You know, it's right, not prejudging, but testing out and checking out for for yourself for that. And sometimes it's really hard to let go of old maps as how we were brought up in childhood, um, that, that's always a challenge to break away from the ways you were brought up and harming of the category. I think there's an interesting thing that we tend to talk about a lot more now, you know, after his death and since the 1960s in particular, is that, that what people consider to be part of this postmodern thought is that, you know, subjectivities and truths with a small t and an s are where the, the, the territories that we, that we investigate in order to understand the variety, the diversity of thought and experience and, and, and not cling to the fact that there's one human experience. We, we really struggle with this idea that there may be universal human values, but despite having these universal human values, there are also these, these important subjectivities where within the un universal human values, there are very particular experiences to the individual and to small groups of individuals, people who are privileged and marginalized and all this sort of critical studies kind of talk. And I think that that's an interesting thing that he would have had to contend with here in this intentional and extensional is that neither one of those things is necessarily the healthy path towards, you know, a, a saner uh, 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 existence. It's the ability to smoothly transition between recognizing your own experience and translating it into thought and action, and then being open enough to others' experiences, their translations into thought and action, and how we find a common good in the midst of this mess. Um, because that's what the human experience is. And I, so I, I, I think, you know, the, the, this interplay, the tensions between these two things are really where the hard work lies in order to actually do something productive and, 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 and be together successfully. And it's not Aristotelian, but it is Socratic. Yes. Right, in that the more that I know, the more I realize what I don't yeah. know. And so I have to right. keep testing 
these things that I do to really be open-minded because it's kind of interesting how many people will profess to be open-minded people, yeah. liberally minded thinkers, liberal people who are not. Well, I, I just wonder because we also, Jackie was so kind to bring that model or that uh, anthropometer. Yes, the, the structural differential uh, that's Lance hanging. Lance wanting to explain it to you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. And uh, this, this was Korzybski's teaching tool for understanding the, uh, uh, you know, the way that we relate to reality. So I was wondering if we could, uh, you know, perhaps explain that. Jackie's looking at you. Do you want to? <laughs> I'm expecting you to do it. Oh. The MC has to do something besides okay. questions out. I mean, well, I brought the um, wind panel up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it only gets right to the left for me. Okay. That's why the date is here. And she didn't bring the beer. Mm. Oh, I was going to say. All right. Well. I'm trying. The structural differential, this was, uh, and, and I believe he came up with this um, when he was uh, going to do a lecture at the New School. Um, so, and, and he actually made models, you know, physical models of this. So this is, this is in a diagramic form. The uh, top of it, broken parabola represents reality. The fact that it's broken is the fact that there is much more to reality than uh, what we um, what we can even be uh, aware of, um, as the lovely Mike Pugh is hoping. Um, okay. Um, the string, the holes leading down to it, we, the holes in it refer to things that we can perceive about reality. The strings coming down from it are the actual perception of it. And so the first circle um, is our perception. And, and he referred to the parabola as the event level because following Einstein, reality is made up of events in space-time. The second level, which corresponds to our perception, is called the object level because what we perceive are things, are objects, not a dynamic, chaotic, constantly changing reality. Uh, we'll we'll hold, leave that one aside for the moment, and then what we the point of the strings coming down is that we only perceive part of what's out there, right? Our perception is selective it, and, uh, and partial. Um, coming down from there is the first verbal level. That's where language comes into play. Um, and again, this is a process of abstracting. Um, the term comes from chemistry where you take something out of something else. So we're taking part of what's out there into our, through our sense perception, we're taking only part of what we perceive into uh, the label that we put on things. And the first level would be it correspond to a name, you know, the specific name of a person. Um, and then the next level would take us further along in abstracting to something like a category where we, uh, you know, if we were to take, like you're all looking at my clue right now, uh, and the reality of him, including the you know internal aspects of uh, you know of his circulatory, nervous, <laughs> digestive system, where we don't have any we don't have any perception of that at all. What we do perceive, though, is is on this level. What you perceive is nonverbal. It is what your senses are taking in. Now I say that's my clue. That's just his name, um, but we've already abstracted because. We're now saying that whatever you're perceiving is part of a category of things that relates to whenever else you've seen Mike Plu, whatever else you may know about Mike Plu from, from the past. Right? Our names tie us together over time. You know, um, so even that is a kind of category. But then I say, you know, Mike Plu is a general semanticist. And that's putting him into a category where we say 
pay attention what he has in common with other general semanticists, ignore what's individual about Mike Plu. Um, and we could say general semanticists are smart people. Um, that would bring us up another level uh, in categories. And so don't uh, ignore what's individual about general semanticists, what's unique about general semanticists, and just pay attention to smart people in general. We could go from there to people. Um, and we could have done this differently. We could have gone from Mike Plu to men. Um, and from there to human beings. Or we could have gone from men to male animals, right, or male organisms. Uh, there's always multiple ways that we can abstract, which is why there's always an element of subjectivity <laughs> to the process. Um, ultimately, it affects reality, <laughs> which is the feedback back into reality. That little thing on the side, that's, that, that's animals. That, because animals do not abstract, they don't have language, so they don't go down. They're also not aware of the reality behind their perception, so they, don't also, they also don't conceive of the event level. Nor do animals in other words, build on experiences from the past. That's where, uh, So when, so when it comes to something like stereotyping, you say, well, you're putting people into categories, you're generalizing about people and in a subjective way, and let's get back to the individual and back to what is it that our senses tell us. You know, if my senses tell us that, you know, you're a perfectly nice person, all of these prejudices that go into stereotyping don't make sense. <coughs> so it, it is this uh, idea to go back into you know, what do scientists do? They use, the, its empirical method is based on sense perception. It's not to ignore categories and generalizations, because that's where theories come from, but it's that we constantly have to check and recheck. So this is his model and his way of, of, of looking at things. Nice job. Thank well, you. Well, that was <laughs> we'll give him an eye. We'll give him an eye. Thank you. Well, so having now that I've done that, uh, I, I, it was uh, we, we had an email from a follower, a general semanticist out in flyover country, Phil Ardry. Um, and he emailed the following suggestion. Um, so, uh, and, and this kind of. Uh, relates to it falls in line with what we've been talking. So he writes uh, two current events topics that might merit discussion. Topics not prominent in Korzybski's time: trans activism and speciesism, human supremacism. Speciesism. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think that goes back to the business about non-identity, right? And that's the progression of our thought that begins at, we begin with certain categories, right? Is that we don't necessarily transform our thinking completely all at once. What is non-identity? So non-identity is that you can't count on the fact that when you put, when you do put a name on a thing that it shares all of the same, uh, all of the same attributes of all the other things that you have named that, right? Is that you, uh, that you have to take the distinct characteristics, like you talk about, you know, Mike Plu and all of the things that I could be categorically, but that, uh, that you haven't captured the, the totality of me as a, an organism, as an entity, as a soul and so forth. And uh, if we treat someone as such, like the, this is what the talk about essentializing is about, um, uh, and you treat me as a fixed figure that you recognize all the attributes of and you take as a whole, you miss the fact that I might change, that, uh, that, that you may not perceive all of the things that are, you know, make me the person that I am and so forth. So like once you know one Mike Blue, right. you know them all. Right, you know them all. Yeah, <laughs> probably. That's probably true, because I don't think that there is anyone else with his name walking around on earth, but you never know. And it's only recently, in the last number of years, that 
people are even talking about the idea that sexuality is on a continuum. Mm -hmm. that you're not, um, you know, a man or woman. What that's it. Now there are people that are intersex. There are people that were born with one physical category but identify with another. And we didn't allow in our culture to even have these discussions that these things existed before very recent times. And the activism, what the people that came out and said, you know, I exist and this is my reality. So Korzybski would call that progress. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think um, I, th this makes me think about Wendell Johnson, who extended the theories of this theory, and he talked about levels of analysis. And it, it makes me think that um, things are on a continuum, but they're also in a larger sphere. And I think when it comes to human sexuality, uh, the either or thinking ha is, you know, binary is so obvious. There are men and there are women that. <laughs> the idea that there was anything in between was just out of the question for people. And so it's a perfect example, really, of, of, of enlightenment happening mm -hmm. when people are saying, I'm not this and I'm not that. And, and what about people who are bisexual and are attracted to both sexes? And they have always existed. Uh, but now we're talking about it. And we're, we're thinking that we should not punish people because they don't fit our category. So it comes along with stereotyping and racism. And you know, I was thinking of something interesting, to me at least, that um, some people come out with the idea that there is no such thing as race. So I sat there and I'm thinking, well, that makes sense to me because we cannot mate with animals, but we can mate with any other human being. So maybe, you know, that should be the defining characteristic, that if you can mate with other human beings, no matter what their race, no matter what their color, you're all in the same boat. Because we cannot mate with a bird. We cannot mate with a That's dog. Yet. Yet. Successful. <laughs> but think about that. It depends on the bird. Think about that concept, that there is no such thing as race because we can mate with anybody. It also determines like who's making the definition. So by the census forms, there are racial definitions. I mean these are cultural definitions. And so if you say, you know, there was a certain number of this race, well you can use that maybe for economics because then Congress can say, well, or That's the legislature can say, okay, well then you can allocate this much money because you have this many people in this category. So it's also important who's doing the defining, what's the purpose of the defining? These definitions don't come from nature, they're human made. And who are the humans doing the definitions and what are the purposes behind mm -hmm. those definitions? Mm -hmm. And that's what Wendell Johnson was pointing out. What level of analysis are you plugging into? Mm -hmm. And now we bring up issues of power, economics, demographics, we're getting mm -hmm. to have the census. Why are they asking, you know, what is your cultural background? Because they need to know how to allocate funds. So that, that you know, Wendell Johnson is a general analysis, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's a tremendous contribution because we cannot analyze society without understanding the levels of analysis that we're approaching. And well, you know, the semantic differential talks about extracting and then there are cultural aspects to it. This other, I always think of the level of, um, Analysis is something surrounding that, but well, could open. you explain that more? Because yeah, um, all right. I'll, the simplest way for me is I'll like what are the levels? Oh, let's. Oh, I don't remember how to. Uh -huh. You know. Um, well, you know, from from level one to level. All right. Let me give the example that I usually think of. Mm -hmm. uh, when you I, when you talk about a car, are you discussing it at the level of steering mechanism, the wheel, the entire car, and then beyond that would be the rules of the road, the, you know, the insurance you have to have, the, you know, all of the different layers and levels that start with maybe the wheel and, a, and an automatic uh, transmission or key or whatever. What are you looking at and how does it relate to the context and the, and the 
and the, the whole entire complex and phenomenon that you're looking at. And I think when we get to society, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about what layers and levels are being impacted and how are the people who are doing the discussing defining it, what are they leaving in, what are they leaving out, and how are they all interrelated. And I say that's media ecology because we talk about uh, media ecology. I think this. Media ecology is general semantics writ large, which means it takes in the entire context. Now, we can't analyze the entire context at once. But we can know what we are putting our flashlight on and know in terms of this analysis of implement, are we looking at level one, are we looking at level two, are we looking at how it interrelates? How, you know, Wendell Johnson categorizes it exactly. I haven't read it in 40 years, but I remember what he said. And I think it's incredibly important because what we hear in political circles now, it, we hear people talking about one level and somebody answering it at another level and everything is going on in course purposes. Mm -hmm. But pe I think people are not stupid, so they're starting to figure it out. To, to bring it back to transactivism, uh, Mike and I, and you can correct me if I'm not remembering this, uh, we went through sexual harassment training in our college uh, in the past year. Yeah. And according to New York City, there are 27 different definitions of gender. Mm -hmm. Wow, what? 27? 27, yeah, don't ask me to remember them. <laughs> and there's like five. But is, it, is that the right number? Do you I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sure that that was it. Yeah. No, and mine is H&H &H Bagel. That's my gender. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Well, that's one, yeah. Again, yeah. That's a description of the binary, of the traditional male female binary. Is the well, it's definition it's of cis. Extensions of it, yeah, yeah. Extensions of it. So, uh, and we're talking gender, right? We're not talking sexuality, we're talking gender. But to, to bring this back to Korzuki then and the idea of non all this, right? The non all. That we can't know everything about anything. And so what we have always understood from the point of view of gender is that there are guys who have a penis and there are women who have a vagina and that's all you need to know, right? That's it. Well, you know, we progressed as a culture to the point where people can say, Mm, no, it's not quite that simple, and it's now not quite that simple to the point of 27 different categorizations. So that's multi-valued orientation. Yeah. But that's isn't well, that also non-additivity, that more is not necessarily better? <laughs> it's certainly different. Uh, more is definitely different. Well, there it's are people extreme, that have one right? To both genitalia. Yeah. yeah. I know my. Yeah. You know. I, I, yeah. yeah. Are, is this recording? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, well, this. Well, yeah. my, my mother. The God rest her soul. She comes from very uh, far country, but, but she would tell me there were two instances. Um, she helped deliver babies in the the um, early thirties that uh, there were born with right. two mm -hmm. genitalia, right. and the doctor made the decision, yeah. the, or not even, it was, it went yeah. pack, and, and, yeah. it's, and all done. And my mom would tell a story of someone who grew up, one of these, and they were just strange, and it didn't know where to, but they didn't know they had been altered. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. that's how it was. I, I think yes, yeah. when, you, when you bring that up, I mean, it strikes me that, um, I, I think of James W. Carey in this case, and, uh, talking about the ritual view of communication, which suggests that through symbolic work we reproduce, we negotiate, we're able to change, um, we're able to subvert uh, different cultural norms that we've established over time. And we have this really fluid ability to, to, to change or, or to, to uh, reinforce things that we've believed in over time. And it's interesting to me that one of the rituals around gender that persists today, and particularly in the in the sort of in the in the presentation era where we record and make theater of all of our life events is that these gender reveal uh, parties where somebody will explode a pink or a blue yeah, yeah. balloon have received a tremendous amount of feedback uh, uh, you know negative feedback from people because this is the ritual reproduction of traditional gender definitions and the children of the parents in, in <coughs> question don't 
have the capacity to self-define and all of the rituals prior to their birth and at their birth and in their formative years may contradict what they actually experience right, right at, the, at the objective level of their own lives and so you know the, we 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 reproduce these things ritually and which is the which is the both the the trouble and which is also the hope for change that we can alter these things by ritual means as well is that if we're in touch with symbolic work and if we're particularly oh it's down the structural differential went down if we're particularly in touch with the structural differential in the way that Lance described it we can replace those rituals with more affirmative rituals and rituals that act to identify all these different levels of abstraction and so forth that can celebrate nuance and diversity and so forth um, and that's really the only means that we have at our disposal save physical intimidation and so forth to make long-lasting and, and, and healthy change at any rate. But again, with respect to, we experience our own gender. We do not understand how others experience gender and there's a multiplicity now of experiences. Yeah. Right. right. So we can't know that because yeah. it's not within our skin. You know? If I could touch on the, the species I do think there's something interesting here is that I, I don't want, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to sort of entangle issues of, I mean, of trans Phil, rights Phil, and so forth. Phil's going to be watching this at some point. Yeah, sure. No, it's um, good. What, talk to Phil. Phil, hi Phil. Hi Phil. Hi Phil. Wish Phil. you were here Phil. Um, <laughs> it strikes me that, the, you know, again, referring to the structural differential, the, 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 um, the little peripheral circle there that doesn't have any strings extending from the objective level. Um, um, and, and Jackie rightly pointed out that beavers don't build better dams, they build the, the same dams. I mean, there may be some sense that there's evolution in there, but it's hard to say that that comes through sort of symbolic work in the way that we do it. But I, but I do think that there's something interesting to, to consider or reconsider about that circle on the structural differential Given and this is this is oh, that one yeah. that one yeah the the the, the, the animal, animal circle yeah, yeah. the animal circle um, the idea that we do understand something a bit more sophisticated today about the emotional character of animals and about some of the more sophisticated symbolic work that animals are capable of that we weren't really Aware. attuned to in in an appropriate way now it's again I, I think it's a stretch to suggest that they're doing time binding work in the way that we recognize it yeah. but they are doing something akin to symbolic work that we don't understand yet. And so it may be that the structural differential may need to be amended in some way to, to account for something that we don't quite understand it, which is, I think, an important thing to, to consider when we think we understand, we have these essentialized views of what species are. And that the di distinctions between our species and other species, we know that we're, we, we've come to understand scientifically that we're closer emotionally to these creatures than, than, than we were before. The stu study of the chimpanzees, the study of the meerkats and other things, and the way that they actually care for each other and they mourn, that there's interspecies right. friendships and so forth, which is quite right. interesting, where yeah, goats right. and elephants make friends and things. Yeah. And right, that we yeah. would never have given them credit for, yeah, yeah, we see, yeah. Yeah, there's lots of Netflix specials, you should go take a look. <laughs> so, so, right, but, but, right, they, they, these interspecies yeah. friendships and so forth, but, which seems absolutely preposterous to me that we didn't recognize before. They do not, not as far as I know. But it seems preposterous to me that we never recognized this before, given that we make friends with all sorts of other animals, right? We make friends with every single animal we encounter that we're not eating right we make friends with these things and so and they and they show us affection in return and not, not mosquitoes you how dare you maybe they're maybe those are love texts that they're giving you but, right but the idea the idea the idea that perhaps we have been making lots of assumptions about these creatures that we co-inhabit the earth with that are incomplete yeah. and they may not they may not need to make Yes. Wait, there's Can I just ask you a question? Yeah. So, wait, so you I'm are scared suggesting, of though, that, <laughs> that there are other species that have symbol making ability and behaviors that we just don't yet understand? Huh? Yeah, well, I mean, they, they talk about the language of meerkats, as one example, is that meerkats have, uh, they, there's a code that they engage with to yeah, communicate dolphins. direction dolphins, or dolphins. 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 But, as, right, but the meerkats, the meerkats are a particularly elephants? interesting one. I and saw a YouTube thing right? where elephants were rescuing a whole herd. Came sure, but, but in terms of symbolic communication, is that they're actually words. There are there are repeated sounds used by meerkats that indicate direction, so that they can map 
a safe path to, to a, 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 you know, a, a safe area and these kind of things. We know that certain chimpanzees and things have sounds that they emit that signify possibly s snakes or, or hawks or these kind of things. And this is all like super rudimentary, but I'm just suggesting that whatever we thought we knew, eventually we come to know something else. Are they and tied by anything? I don't know. I, I, it doesn't seem to me that they are, but I, I would be foolish to say they're not time binding definitively. I think there was a little That's evidence of chimpanzees um, doing a little time binding. Just to gorillas do sign language and they recognize right. people that That's they really teach. teach. Oh, sure, sure. I think you're being very extensional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what right. does he would say? Good job. Uh, Good. But Thanks. you also said that, Thanks, Count. You, you Thanks, also said yeah. that you know these sounds signify, right? And yeah. I, I mean, the, the question about speciesism yeah. is that humans are the symbol making, the symbol using yeah. species, and that is and the basis user. upon which yes, that's Kenneth Burke, right. your tier, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Kenneth and Burr that's stuff. the basis upon which we have, you know, sort of dominion over the planet and sure. over all of the other species. Sure, but if we hear something. Like, it, oh, that sound always refers to a snake. I mean, it may not be building a rocket to go to the moon, but at the same time, you know, it's the use of novel intellectual powers to interact with an environment. Right. Mm -hmm. We should respect and that, that in some way, right? And that really right. is used too. Well, that's different. Can, can we put, Marty, can we put animals in here? Kill them in this area? Well, animals experience this. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, yeah. I mean, could we put them in here and take it down? Well, I don't think it's not, not, not with current knowledge. Not with current knowledge. Not with current knowledge. Well, we have this problem with yeah. the special effects. Does it for animals or for the rest of species? Thank you. Does it for animals like out? this? Instead of going. Tell you there's a stranger at well, the door? Well, I, I think the idea is that they're not aware right. of the connection. Um, but I. I, I as far as we know. As far as we know. As far as we know. Sorry. 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 I, I but I would point out, you know, that I mean, Gregory Bateson, you know, makes this connection about uh, you think about dogs and wolves and the kind of ritual behavior they engage in, so that uh, their displays of of dominance and subordination involve a kind of of play, you know, and the play is sort of the pathway that you do know play behavior it, we see in animals and that the play engage, they engage in would be that uh, kind of like fighting that goes up to but then in, in, a, in a way signifies what would be a real fight so that the one that displays a subordination lies on its back and bears its throat and the one displaying dominance puts his mouth on the throat but doesn't rip the other one's throat out and, you know, and, and kill them, you know, and that that, you know, signifies, but it, it, it is more of a kind of signal in a way or an, an analogy rather than the digital mm -hmm. form form of a symbol. Uh, I, I do want to, you know, make the, the, the other point, though, that if we sort of step back and look at where we came from, right, Lamarck and, you know, going back to Aristotle, the theory, the idea that species are set and never change mm -hmm. and then we get to darwin mm -hmm. who says you know it, it evolves mm -hmm. you know that there's really one life life is one thing it follows one principle of evolution and, you know from whatever its beginnings was to to us and so it's a continuum you know and that is very much in keeping with general uh, you know and, and feeds into the general semantic sensibility because things are continuous and they are subject to change. Um, and, and that does suggest that, um, I, one of the ways that I think that Korzybski was of his time was the suggestion that human beings were completely different mm -hmm. right, from other mm -hmm. forms of life. And, and others, Suzanne Langer's like that as, as well, you know, and other <laughs> philosophers of that period. And I think now we're, we're seeing, you know, at least there is a continuum, whether, Mm -hmm. You know, I think Tom and I are more skeptical about what Mike's bringing up. <laughs> yeah, but whether that. Well, you know, 
you know, whether that, that uh, represents actual symbolic activity, uh, you know, that's a question of definition more than anything, but, but, it, but that there is an evolutionary continuum that we can, we can recognize. I had an interesting experience last summer with my neighbor's dog. The dog people that kept the dog for two for two weeks or whatever while they were on vacation returned the dog to the apartment, and my neighbor called and said, "Please come over and check on my dog. That we're going to be a few more hours." So I walk in and I say hello, and the other the uh, walker boarder was leaving, but said to me, I just gave the dog's Trixie a bowl of water. So I go to the kitchen and I look and the dog drank the entire bowl because it was one of those 100 degree days. The dog looked at me and then pushed the bowl toward me, got up to my feet and nudged me like, I want more water. <laughs> and so I knew that this was the, when I gave the water okay. and, and, and I guess, you know, I said to myself, that's as close to symbolism as I've seen a dog do. Well, but that's signalic, but it's signalic, signalic, it's purely symbolic. In a, in a yeah. particular... But I think, you know, that um, since our our time is, is limited, um, I know we haven't touched on, you know, the elephant in the room, so to speak, um, you know, which is politics. Uh, you know, literally the elephant, you know, politically. But I'm not going to... I'd rather open things up for uh, questions from the audience that would like to pose to our panelists. Uh, so what would you like to ask uh, them What would course, about what Korzybski would say? Karen? I got to ask, what would he say about fake news and propaganda? I can't not. How can I not? Well, there is something called facts that can be verified, and science tells us to look and try to verify them. And I always say, at what level of analysis are you presenting the facts? And that's where we get into all this cross I'm better to afraid that what we have made of the evolution of news is one that well, we are all on the same page, only CBS, NBC, uh, everybody was on the same page once in 1960 when there was only three television stations giving the same information. And today, you, we don't get the same information from the same sources. We are not on the same page. Same, get us, to, get, to get us on a, to agreement about climate change is now going to be and please answer the original question with that in mind. Here is where the semantic differential has to evolve into the semantic differential. The semantic environment has to expand into the idea of a media environment because the examples that you brought up are all examples of television news. And that's only one medium. That's only one media environment for receiving news and on the industry's end for providing and interpreting with a commercial imperative news. Oh, but tell the, the newspapers are basically disappeared at the same time. So the, well, the newspapers have. that existed in those three television uh, station era mm -hmm. have, have disappeared almost entirely left with three or four papers in the country. But we have 20... I know, a hundred uh, cable television stations and okay. well, just, a, just a few big ones. I mean, you know, Fox yeah. and MSNBC and yeah. CNN, those are the three stations. Right. And I think, look, I think if Nixon was around today, if McCarthy was around today, they probably, my opinion, they probably wouldn't have gone because Fox would have saved them. Except Nixon had shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Fox doesn't. It took so a while. Going back to the beginning, because they would frame it in such a way, because back then, everyone watched the same communication. Yes, yes. So it was framed one way. Yes. So now, because it's framed so in opposing ways, yes. you have a substantial amount of population on each side that you go to whatever way the TV station channels on. But back to World War II, the Korzybski actually did make a part of World War II that I took down from the uh, Korzybski bio. And he talked about the morale-building potency of plain facts and figures. 
think, and I think that's a dated statement mm -hmm. because back then in World War II, with everyone sort of pulling together and really interesting right. facts and figures, where today I don't think that's the case. So I really don't know what Kozinski would say about because I mean this this is what he said then, but now the media environment has changed so much that uh, it's a real problem when people. In general, semantics is about having people think about things to get to a more, in quotes, objective truth. But what if you're not interested in that? Okay, and what, then where does general semantics come in? Is it, well, I don't care about that. I just want guns, or I just want my pro-life position, and I don't care what it is, I'll accept whatever it is to get my position. Mm -hmm. Reason be damned. Wow. But isn't yeah, that a limit then to Kaczynski's whole enterprise? Yes. You know, general yes. semantics is never going to work for people who are not interested in the ways in which you can help them. I think you that's, can say that. That's, that's, well, that's, <laughs> that's the problem. Mike well, has, uh, can, can I suggest that as, as different as it seems, that I would suggest pro pro possibly counterintuitively that it's not as different as it seems, mm -hmm. and that there's nothing particularly novel about the million conversations that are happening as compared to the sort of three conversations that were happening before. Mm -hmm. Most of the chatter that occurs as a result of this enormous media sphere, and including our sort of multi-directional media sphere, is is talking about talk. Is that for the most part the discourse is set at a particular level. And that what all we're doing is we're just rearranging the language and the and the ideas at some level, moving them around into different shapes, and we don't make much traction on any of them. And so we don't for example, I think, you know, this is this is the way that the media and the political environment actually interact, is that we have the problem in America that sixty-five percent of the eligible voters in the country do not participate in the process. I would suggest, possibly counterintuitively, that those people understand general semantics better than 35 people who are intensely participating in the process, mm -hmm. because what they recognize is that we've got this um, this uh, two-value orientation in our politics. We have the two-value orientation being reproduced ritually in our media sphere, including all this crazy talk that goes back and forth between people, that we don't actively question the ground upon which the figure appears. and. Those 65% of those people say, there's nothing in there for me. I could jump in and participate in that, but it's all nonsense, and it does not speak directly to my experience, my immediate political concerns. And I mean, I think what you see, interestingly, is that Trump tapped into that quite successfully. I think what you see is Bloomberg is attempting a sort of a one foot in and one foot out approach to that as an outsider. Bernie Sanders is quite successful in that. In fact, electorally, his strategy is to not go after Republican voters or you know, sway Democratic voters. It's to go after that vast majority of people who are not happy with this two-valued orientation. And you know, the, in parliamentary systems, for example, you have all kinds of other complex problems to deal with. But we do not have that system. We stick with the two-valued orientation, and it drives people out of the process completely. So I'd suggest that despite the fact that we have a million more media outlets contending with one another that the conversation hasn't re dramatically shifted in any way. It's just more chaotic. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it, it's an echo chamber. You know, if, you, if you pay attention to all these different, on what, take one day and you listen to Fox, CNN, you look at the different newspapers, you will see the same stories being treaded in different ways yeah. over and over and all over the um, No, I was just going to add really quickly that Mike, what you're talking about is created by the two value orientation that is a two-party right. system. Yes. Right. right. It comes from there before it's delivered to us as chatter and media. And that there's only one sort of, we, we're arguing that's about spin. the same that's economic that's ground, spin. is that we don't question our economic system. Yeah, right. We don't, we, we talk about fixing our economic system from within the economic system. And the traction that people are gaining, whether it's libertarian traction or socialist traction or these other sorts of political traction, are coming from people who stand at least in principle, are standing outside the system saying, look at how the system has failed so many people. And that's appealing to a lot today. It, it, the two-valued orientation is still rooted in this one choice, this one economic choice. The one percent. So, well, and, and just the fact that we, the, just the fact that we're all participants in this one global economic system and that there can't be an alternative because it's all too interconnected and complex and that we give up before we've entertained any radical transformations, which may be the recipe. And some people are thirsty for that recipe, but a lot more people are afraid because the two-value orientation, or that one-value orientation of this one economic system is safer for them and less risky to consider. 
Um, I'm sorry, can I just... Well, can, maybe we can yeah, go ahead. get some more questions. Uh, Dina and Nora, you... Um, I, I actually want to... Well, let's why don't we let Nora have a question. Can I ask you about your input about, uh, like, why is there such a polarization against, like, Iran? Um, particularly when it comes to producing like a nuclear means for production of electricity and other stuff that would benefit their nation. Like what is the rhetoric, like the American rhetoric, behind that type of polarization against Iran? Yeah, but there is specifically, I, I know there is the whole Middle East, but I am just interested to find out specifically about Iran. Like, well, I think Iran basically in 1979, when the, the Shah was our guy. Right. And then when the Shah was overthrown, they took host American hostages, right. and then you had this us against them. Who's the us in this equation? Well, the United States. He's yeah. our guy, but the, at the United States, I mean, I'm sure not everybody would support what the Shah no, represented. Right? Of course so. everybody would. I'm right. talking about politically, I'm talking about the That's leaders. The yes. Yes. Only on the political <laughs> level, not on the individual <laughs> level. Who knows what people right. say. But, but I think it goes back to 1979. I mean, basically, you know, World War II, you know, we fight the Germans. Today we're fighting with the Germans. They were against Iran 50 years from now. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. You just never know. In but I mean, I think it started in 79. But why but do right. you think they're anti-Iranian, uh, specifically? Can we just... Yeah, Tom, go ahead. Again, Finland has a nuclear power program. We're not worried about that. Exactly, Great. that's and my point. Yeah. The, 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 the worry is only in yeah. Iran. Sure. Th that's my question. Well, Finland isn't going to do anything with Well, you might also... Well, how do you know they are going to do something with Iran? Based on history. Well, you know, I mean, if you, if you want to really, like, make the analogy, the comparison, yeah. Pakistan got the bomb, yeah. and at the time... Uh, Pakistan was, uh, I mean, um, I think against the Soviet Union. Right. So we were, I don't think we were happy about it. And but India already had it. But we, India already had and it. India already had it. Right. I mean, in, in some ways that's considered the most likely um, arena for uh, the use of atomic weapons uh, at present. But. Uh, you know, we, we didn't go crazy mm -hmm. about that. That's my question, why? That's, you know, I just would like to understand as a Middle Eastern, like I do not understand the polarization of hatred yeah. against the Shiite population. And I am a Sunni, I mean, I, I don't identify as a Sunni, I identify as a Muslim woman. I don't believe that these sects should even exist, like the labeling and the stereotyping, but you know, I really do not get the discourse behind that type of polarization. I mean, part of it, it seems to be about the concern with what we call terrorism, which is to say, stateless entities, stateless armies fighting against the hegemony of power in the world, right? And the states, the nation states that support or supposedly support them, and the ways in which they do, um, that's really interesting in the face of the things that are going on in various nation states around the world who are starting to act in ways that smack of what we worry about as quote unquote terrorism when you've got authoritarian leaders rising up and being supported enough to, to be in power in you know the United States, in the Philippines, I mean, what's going on with Brexit and Boris Johnson, what's going on in Brazil, add them all up. So you know it, it's a kind of a scary world to make this distinction between nation states who can uh, be at odds with one another, and this idea that there are these other entities that endanger that stasis. Did we help you at all? I, if I could just interject a tiny little bit, I follow this information in the media, and how they cover the Middle East and have, and all kinds of conflicts around the world. This is a, it's a conflict between <clears throat> those who currently have political and military power, which is the United States at the moment, the greatest military power in the history of humankind ever. It, we have the uh, 
we, we spend more money on uh, on our military as uh, I think it's the number a year or different numbers but it's about the next 12 10 or 12 other uh, countries the most powerful countries in the world combined and the, and the numbers are still going up the, 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 the amount of money that is still going up and this is a result uh, of people of the entire country entire world basically ignoring the uh, the uh, the, uh, the warning about the military industrial complex and uh, here we are now which is about 60, 70 years later <clears throat> 60 years later and uh, the only thing the United States has at the moment is military power there it's lost moral uh, influence uh, uh, the entire political influence of the United States is completely based on military power and military so we can exert influence only through threats and uh, uh, and, and uh, implied threats and implied threats and uh, trade there's no uh, sorry trade embargoes trade embargoes uh, well, economic strength you're leaving that out well, can, <coughs> uh, can we move on yeah, I don't, I, we're really trying to relate this back to general Samantha. semantics. So, um, Adina, you had a, a question now? Uh, I, I yeah. think I have forgot it. And I'm okay. around. So, <laughs> one second, but okay. first of all, I just want to congratulate you all. I, it was really, really exciting to hear, particularly yeah. how you put Krasinski, how you appreciated Krasinski in context. George has a phone call. <laughs> it's okay. Can you share it with all of us? Sure. 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 That was my. Oh, I thought it was. I do it already. That was my. What did Korzybski say? Having like thinking about the complexities of sometimes like you know how you, you try to assess a theorist or a poet or anybody from the time, like, you know, somebody that might have been an anti-Semitic town, you know, any number of people that we can't, you know, and, and, and try to sort of see it in the context of that. So I, I, I think that was really important and really exciting to hear about. It. Particularly, it's not really a well-formed question because I think it's true, but um, probably Mike could uh, as, uh, address this fast because these were some of the things you're thinking about. But just jumping off your point about, you know, um, the, um, the facts and, and, and all the, the problematics surrounding that, I think, you know, I'm, I'm pretty worried, as we all are very plagued with that. And I was just thinking about Krasinski's, you know, being a staunch scientist and, you know, th then what happens with, you know, the, uh, and something that you mentioned about the notions of systems within systems and then thinking about about you know whether it's string theory or, or you know mm -hmm. or, or and 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 like or quantum physics and so what happens at, uh, to notions of when it's you know it's those are highly scientific but then they lay so intricately layered and the complexities that arise within, you know, so with that, and then leading that to contemporary theories of maybe how subjectivity arises as, as, as so multi-perspectival or as subjectivity is redefined as, as a polyglossic enunciated process. There's something in there, and I'm not quite sure, that connects that is how maybe in the zeitgeist that the sort of fake facts you know like that's the negative side of of, of all of this is that making any sense i mean i think i think i can draw some things out of there that i, I mean i i i try to, i can't turn it like i don't uh, well, I, I think yeah, right. I, I speak. I speak, I speak wine. So, right. oh, I, I speak wine. <laughs> and you know, me. and I know you. 
I actually, I think that, um, you know, I was working, I mentioned James W. Carey a little earlier, and I was working with some, you know, intro students with James W. Carey in the first chapter of his book, Communication is Culture. And I always, I, I always blow the exact wording of, of what, he, what he talks about, but he says there's a, that, alas, there is, do you remember what he says? Alas, there is, um, do you remember what he says? Well, I do, I remember the sentiment of it. There's an illusion, there's an illusion in our, in our faith, in our symbolic work, right? And uh, that the idea is that we draw things out of that objective level and we live through the subjective aspects of it, right? Is that we live on this layer of subjectivity in the world. We build the world in symbolic work and we take up residence in it. And there's an illusion in that. And right, and that's what Korzybski was really after, is like, how do we avoid the pitfalls of that illusion and all the symbolic work we're doing? We're building a house and we're living in it because we can't possibly see all of these things. And so if we start to look at all the layers and we start to, right, this is the process of general semantics is trying to drill down into a more objective point of view through language, through symbolic work in order to create a, a saner mindset, right? In order to live in a more but healthy way, right? There's any no, I, do. I mean, I, I, think that, I think that there's an important, there's, there's an, I mean, I don't want to go too far into this, but that, you know, the paradigms of positivity and post-positivity and social construction, as we talk about this evolution of thought, where people believed in a single objective truth, which is fine, because in the hard sciences, there's, you know, we've discovered lots about, we, we sort of created these concepts about gravity and so forth, and the post-positivist said, well, we don't possibly, we can't possibly know everything about it, all we can deal with is the observable phenomena, so we'll measure those, and the rest is a mystery. And then the social constructionists come along in the 60s and say, sure, all that's cool, and we respect all these big T-truths and little T-truths, but the fact of the matter is we mostly, the citizens about us all over the world, don't deal with things this in, in this sort of empirical way. It's a very high I mean, level of abstraction. And I mean, but Korzybski yeah. was trying yeah. to get yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. Korzybski yeah. was trying to get us to just, there, there is an objective reality out there for Krasinski. Yep. We can never know it. We can only get a sense of it. That's mm -hmm. the idea of the map and the territory. Right. We create maps, but but uh, we can have better or worse maps. Yeah. That's the you know right. you can have a map that leads you into a brick wall or a map that takes you home. And that, that, that's the difference between science and insanity, yeah. is that you have a map that corresponds to the territory. And it's the structural similarity between the map and the territory that, that scientists are able to get closer to. Um, and that's the bottom line. Does the map work? Does it take you where you need to Do go? Share and if it doesn't, then you've gotta, you've gotta yeah, fix it. And, yeah, and, sure and it may work, uh, you know, today and a week from today. It, it may it, things have may have changed, and you need to change your map. And I think that's the practical dimension of it, though, because I think you know the, the the idea is that most of the people who walk around on this planet are not going to achieve this incredible clarity, right? Is that we do we 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 live with these illusions, we create things through symbols, we live with them, we live in this world, and there's all these confusions and so forth. We can get better at it. And the getting better at it part, and not, not necessarily being perfect at it, but the getting better at it part is the practical task of, of you know, the therapeutic mission of general semantics, and for those of us that teach it, right, is that we reach enough people that that trickles out somehow into some sense out there. I, I'd like to get to another question, if we could, because this is um, Bobby. Two questions. OK. But, Please, I defer. Okay. Who has Um. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much. It was a very lively, very engaging discussion. I'm really new to um, Krasinski and gen general semantics, so I'm curious. Was why is it called general semantics? Was there a belief that the way to truth was through language and verbal logic? Why general semantics? Well, and what is meant by the semantic differential? I've heard that mentioned. That's a struggle differential. Okay. 
Well, general semantics was the term as Korzybski gave his theory, and later on felt that was not such a good term because it's confused with semantics. Mm -hmm. Right. But Korzybski wasn't in, originally, in, he was from Poland, he spoke a number of languages, English wasn't his first language, and the semantics part is, is I think, semanian, which is meaning. Mm -hmm. And so it's a general theory of meaning, that's what he wanted to get out into the world, and of course most people don't take it that way, so when I say, you know anything about general semantics, well yeah, I studied semantics in college, and we got to explain what the difference between semantics and general semantics. So it's probably a poor designation, but he came up with it as a general theory of meaning. That was his intention. Mm -hmm. The original um, name he gave it was human engineering, mm -hmm. which really flopped. Worse. <laughs> <That's> worse. <laughs> so, so, yeah. well, what would you call he, it? He also name? wanted to call it anthropology. Yeah, oh, that's really? Yeah. That's interesting. Well, that, that would have been better. <laughs> but, but then you look at that was taken. It was taken. So empirical model of this, he called it anthropometer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it makes sense because um, culture is part. Okay, um, because our time's running out, got another question here. Uh, I want to address the uh, the issue of self evidence, and I'm going to start with the conversation real quickly. If I put a gun to your head, would you realize that as being a threat? as opposed to what you were speaking about, violence by proxy. That's the Depends on who you are. Psychological if element. If you put a gun to my head, I wouldn't feel It comes down to subjectivity then. Cool. Sure. Okay, I'm because afraid, your, your perception of the situation is a self-evident point on, in your paradigm in your mind. Right. And the gun might mean nothing to you. Yeah, or possible. if you come from a culture that doesn't know what a gun is, whether you get bombed by a missile or sure. a gun in your head, it's the same kind of effect. It's detrimental to your well-being. Okay. I digress. And if it's Plato, cosmology, Plato. in one of his dialogues, says Socrates could have sat there and chewed the fat with any one of his great learned you know, students, and they still would never have uncovered the unknown unknown. It was self-evident to him, if you wanted to figure out what the Demiurge, was in Greek, Demiurge, the creator. The, no, no sex, neutral, creative force. Get up and take a walk outside. And if you can conclude that everything is into your favor, then it was self evident that there was a positive force in your life. And this subjectivity, this subjectivity. We since the industrial age, since the collectivization into bigger cities, we've lost touch with the self-evidency of some of our actions. And you have a generation, because I lived that portion of my life through this generation, that's become digitalized. They digitized. And everything is on a screen. So when you speak about how the US military is recruiting people, they're recruiting people that are very adept at video games. Mm -hmm. like that so therefore you have a mechanism now of displaced aggression now is that natural is it good is it bad I don't think there's any such disposition to it it is what it is but I still think if someone hits you in the face it's self-evident it's gonna hurt and I think if we could just somehow come back to understanding the effects of our actions and to, to personify them, it would make for a better understanding world. More extension. General semantics. That's right. <laughs> Can I try this as a partial response? And I don't mean to sound like it's too valued. When we're thinking about extensional and objective truths, with respect to the physical world and the biological world, I think we can get closer and we've gotten there in so many ways. When we think about the things that humans create individually and collectively, right? So this is Vico talking about what we have invented. That's where objective truths get fuzzy. When we start to talk about our talk, Mm -hmm. Right? Then, hmm, then we're going to have a problem 
that that's always going to be pulled back into the intentional. Does that make sense? Well, if you look at the Apollo program and the moon landings, there's a whole counterculture movement that says those were all fabricated in the studio. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I believe they landed on the moon. Sure. But then I question my perspective. Was I there? <laughs> Am I dogmatic enough to believe in something as factual and how valid is my belief? And I start challenging myself to ask myself, how do I base my decision to believe this? And it causes an endless loop. Where did they get that famous picture of the surface and with the flag? Two thirds of the no, no, and the two thirds of the Earth in the background. See. The picture where we say this is the first time we saw the whole of humanity except for three people. Disney. Hmm. This is before. Well, the blue screen. Photoshop. We do, you know, I mean, we do depend on community right. and the idea of science and these things being public so that they can be checked and rechecked. And that's the best we can do because, I mean, unless you can. Uh, determine everything for yourself. Or yeah. well, social collusion. Well, you, you want a consensus. A social <laughs> so the bigger the bigger the population reviewing and agreeing, the more valid the argument in that that respect, whatever it might be. Well, except you know, here's the thing, right? That we understand that that science and technology work according to certain principles, and those same principles. We're in operation in terms of uh, satellites circling the Earth and going to the moon. And the fact that your mobile phone works and you can go on the internet and that you can get satellite television and the fact that airplanes can work, you know, are evidence that this approach, you know, again, which is part of really a, a kind of co collective, cohesive set of ideas, you know, has validity. It works for us. So since the same collective says, yes, we went to the moon, right? The same collective says, yes, vaccines do prevent illness. You know, the same collective says, yes, there is climate change going on. It is an existential threat to, to human life, and it is ca being caused by human activity. Um, I find that, that these other things, like airplanes and mobile phones, serve as evidence that I, uh, at least suggest to me that I ought to believe the same people uh, who are making these claims. Now, isn't that in the category of operational definitions and operational right. conclusions. And I think too, like Korsipsky and uh, Wendell Johnson and, and Hayakawa, if you could take this and go up and down this thing all you want or, or up and down Hayakawa's ladder, or but there are times when you just have to stop and get the job done. I mean, where you've got to just stop and do it, which was Korsipsky was very much for. Don't, you know, just talk. Pretty soon, you just have to do it. In other words, accept some conclusions, temporarily at least, mm -hmm. so you can function. Right. Right. Faith That's in your faculties and faith in our yeah. common experience. Operationalism exactly. is saying, for the purposes of whatever, you know, for the study or for our task, we are going to accept this, we're going to use this definition, right. and then we see what we come up with. And, and if the definition works, we keep using it. Um, I, I, we're, we're almost out of time, but let's yeah. hear from Kristen. Come on. Please. Well, and this, no, this just do. Come on. Come on. Can of worms is what does Kristen think about uh, what would he say to Thomas Kuhn's idea of the paradigm shift, which is the, which is the limit of um, mm -hmm. scientific knowledge that once, once science holds itself into categories and has these um, terms that are accepted as fact. You know, you have to you have to you have to broaden the field in order to actually have anything evolve. Cell phones clearly are an example of that. Something had to evolve and change in the field of communication for a cell phone to even to even exist. So the whole idea that 
everything had, you know, moving up into that, you know, that ultimate category at the top of the field. But again, I don't know that the large, large, large. The title of this book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, it, implicit in that is that things evolve. And I think that's well, actually it's implicit it's in it is that there are revolutions, that right. it's not but, a but, steady evolution. But that it can, but things continue to change and shift. Mm -hmm. With who inspired by I doubt it. No. Well, we really don't. We don't know. No, well, well, Kuhn wrote in the 50s, really. I mean, yeah. it's amazing how far back that goes. And people <coughs> at that time were aware. I mean, Korzybski was part of the popular culture. Yeah of uh, the kind of 40s and 50s yeah. and there was a time magazine piece about him uh you know really? lewis mumford mentions him in in uh in one of his books i think it's in the name of sanity which refers to it was like after the bomb uh you know it's what it just starts out and then referring to korzybski and mumford was a popular writer so you know he was somebody that uh you know, people talked about and and uh, came up in in like fiction. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, in, in the birds. Uh, right. She's studying general semantics at Berkeley. That's right. At Berkeley, so uh, yeah. 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 Jimmy Henry. That's right. Right. Well, yeah, for France. So, so uh, it's uh, she probably did know uh, of Korzybski. Yeah. And. And I think it comes back to, you know, we got maps and we do have to change them. And, uh, you know, in terms of Kuhn's thing, you know, sometimes it's just filling in parts of the map. And sometimes you say, you know, we, we got to start from scratch or we got to like, you know, make a new map because this this one isn't getting the job done. Maybe make this map a little bigger. So yeah. Those maps, we also learned back up, sorry. And then when you did, uh, Possibly stole his idea from a doctoral dissertation by a guy named Ludwig Fleck. So what do you his work? Mm -hmm. A little bit of power, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Whoa. But Krasinski so built on Cash's concert, right? Well, on, on many um, people, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah Nicolai, yeah. I think important. Um, and I think that's part of time binding, is we're all building on the work of others, which is why we're here standing on Korzybski's shoulders. There you go. Um, to And saying, what would Korzybski say? And I think, uh, you know, our time being up now, uh, I want to thank our panelists. Yay. Thank Good you. Job. Good job.